Um, <clears throat> it's really amazing how spirit, when, when spirit wants to move through and it wants to say something, it wants to say something, you know? <laughs> and so uh, what you guys don't know because you weren't here first service is that um, part of Anne Marie's um, invocation is, is the end kind of part of my talk and I, I will remind you of it because don't be sorry. That's what I'm saying. There is a powerful spiritual expression that wants to come through and it wants to be heard and so it will be heard and it'll be heard twice this morning. <laughs> there is one mind and, and that's kind of how synergy works, right? When we're working in harmony, we're all just kind of partaking and participating in this awesome expression of life. We're like one of seven billion right but we're all interconnected so that's wonderful that's okay really <laughs> it's fabulous actually I've been thinking a lot lately about all of the people and experiences that have brought me right here where I am. Do you ever do that? Do you ever think about, gosh, if it weren't for this person or that thing happening to me, I might not be right where I am. Yeah. And it's a beautiful feeling, especially when we're, we're, we're somewhere where we want to be, right? <laughs> and so lately I've been a little bit nostalgic because I'm about to graduate in a few months. And I, I've been thinking about all of the people who have supported me uh, before I even realized that the call in my heart as a humanitarian was in the avenue of, of ministry. And the person that I wanted to share with you this morning, even though it's not Father's Day, is my father. Um, I, I have kind of an interesting experience with dads. I never knew my biological father, and I still don't know anything about him but his name. <clears throat> but when I was 17, I, for many different reasons, moved out of my home, and I moved in with my boyfriend and his parents. And, you know, they weren't rich. They barely had enough money to get by, but they were willing to take me in. And I experienced so much love, and it opened my mind to what really being a part of a family meant. It means that you don't just think about yourself. It means sometimes you fa sacrifice for the greater good of the whole. And, and this experience that I learned specifically from Steve, who's now passed away, is this experience of the divine masculine. I had never known deep male love in that way. And so it's interesting because I grew up in this philosophy and you know we don't teach that God is a person but all people are incarnations of, of the divine, right? And so I always got confused as to why Jesus called God Father. You know, I never got that. But once I met and was filled with this divine love from, from this Father, I got it. I got it because the kind of love that he shared with me was this protector, this warrior, this fearless leader, this person who was willing to sacrifice and do whatever it took for, for his family. And that was so beautiful and moving to me. But one of the coolest things that he ever taught me was about the attitude of the outlaw. And so this morning, our talk title is An Outlaw State of Mind. Now, don't worry, I'm not promoting going and breaking the law or anything. Don't go getting yourself thrown in jail and say that Nicole said I should on Sunday. <laughs> what I'm talking about is this, this inner, this mental outlaw, this inner pull within us to live life our own way. It's, it's that stepping outside of the box and saying, I'm going to think for myself. I'm going to do what I'm called to do. I'm going to step into this world as my own wholehearted, authentic being, regardless of what you think. And so Steve, he really represented this kind of outlaw, you know. He was, a, he was a mechanic, so he smoked cigarettes and he was greasy and kind of like James Dean, you know. But he, he just loved us to death. And, it, and no matter what, we always knew that we were going to be taken care of no matter how little we had. And so in honor of him, I want to share with you three aspects of an outlaw state of mind. So the first aspect is we just don't give a damn. Okay? You'll see. 
<laughs> the second aspect is we make up our own rules. Okay, how many of you make up your own rules already? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. I, this is my tribe, I knew that. <laughs> and the third one is we live and let live. And that one becomes easy once we've done the first two. And so I love this first aspect, this I just don't give a damn. Because you know what? For so many years, I did. I did care. I cared so much. I grew up in a really small town in Arizona. And probably from the age of 12 to 25, I was, I, I was depressed and anxious because I was trying to conform to the way that society there thought I should be. Right? I was supposed to grow up, and then I was supposed to get married almost as a teenager and have kids, and that was the end of my life, you know? <laughs> Cash your checks at Walmart and, and be happy, you know? And, <laughs> and that's okay, and I'm not putting them down. It's just, I felt like my soul was stifled. Like, I had ideas, and, and I had spiritual beliefs that were different from the people around me. And not to put theirs down, but it just wasn't mine. And so my spirit was, was suffocating. Can any of you relate to this? Have any of you ever had this experience? It's rough. What I realize, though, is that we find ourselves in, these, in, the, in bondage. And sometimes we might not even know how we got there. It could have come from a long time ago. There's this inner bondage and there's an outer bondage, and we find ourselves in this inner bondage, maybe we're tied down to these chains, these chains of false beliefs, these chains of what society said we were supposed to do and be, how we were supposed to act. Maybe we were supposed to turn our music down. Maybe we weren't supposed to be so bold. Maybe we weren't supposed to speak our mind. Maybe our parents didn't know how to love us. And so we held on to their abusive words, whether they meant to be or not. And we find ourselves wrapped up in this chain. And then there's this outer chain, this outer bondage that we find ourselves in. Hopefully we begin to recognize it. There's this religious structures, right? There's socioeconomic structures that hold us down. There's familial structures, educational structures. All of these ways that we're told that we're supposed to be in the world. All of this quote unquote success that we're supposed to find in someone else's way of finding it. And we find ourselves trapped. I found myself trapped in this box and looking around and wondering, how did I get here? And really, how the heck do I get out of here? And this is where the spiritual practice of, I just don't give a damn, comes into play. Because let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, every one of us who are sitting in a seat here Every one of us who comes to a center for spiritual living, every one of us who studies spiritual practices and tries to think for ourselves, we come from a long line of outlaws. These are mental outlaws. <laughs> These are teachers and spiritual leaders who have been deconstructing and trying to tear down the chains of doctrines and societal ideas for centuries. One of the greatest examples of this is with Jesus. Remember when, well, we weren't there, but <laughs> remember when we hear that he'd rather go hang out at the water well with the prostitutes and the untouchables instead of hanging with the high priests? That's a rebel. Remember Emerson in his, in his statement that imitation is suicide? That when we're trying to be like someone else, we're literally killing ourselves in his call to self-reliance. 
And it, this mental outlaw, this mental rebel shows up in Emma Curtis Hopkins, you know, in her call, in, in, in her reminding us that there is good for us and we ought to have it. And not only ought we have it, but it is ours and we better name it and claim it and state it and write it and rewrite it and, and share it with the world because it is our inheritance. Now that is rebellious. Let me tell you, you go outside and talk to somebody and say, well, th this is my good. I was born good. They'll be like, okay. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. And we begin to find this, this mental outlaw in ourselves, this rebellious outlaw, when we finally take that step outside of the box and we say, you know what? I'm done. I am no longer going to be bound up and tied up in my fears and your fears and the perpetuation of these fears any longer. I'm done, right? We're done. And then maybe we put on our spiritual metaphorical bandana. We raise our chest to the sky and we hold our head up high and we say, I'm going to affirm that my life is good that my life is worth something, that I am worth something. Ladies and gentlemen, nowadays, this is a very rebellious idea. But we, we are the ones to show this and to represent this. And this is the kind of practice that I've had to use to finally step into a wholehearted, authentic life. This is the very spirit of the New Thought Movement. And this is the spiritual practice of, I just don't give a damn. The second um, aspect of an outlaw state of mind is we make up our own rules. We make up our own rules. Now this one can be a little tricky sometimes. It takes a lot of power and courage. I want to ask you a question. How, okay, what do you think Nelson Mandela Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Susan B. Anthony all had in common. Freedom. Any ideas? Just say it. Huh? They, made they did make their own rules, and it was courage and freedom, but every single one of them were arrested making up their own rules. <laughs> Once again, I'm not promoting it, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, Susan B. Anthony was arrested in 1872 in her hometown of Rochester, New York. Why? Because she tried to vote. Because she tried to vote. <laughs> OK. She decided that rule was not going to work for her. She spent the entire rest of her life working to see this, this new rule come into being. And although she died before it, it was a law, the 19th Amendment now does say, is starting in 1920, that women do have the right to vote. She made up her own rules. One of the most inspiring people of all time, Martin Luther King, he was arrested like more than five times. Why? For peacefully protesting racism and segregation. And he said, you know what? I'm changing the rules. That rule does not work for me. I'm making up my own rule. One of these times that he was arrested, he was put in the Birmingham jail, and he ended up writing one of the most beautiful sermons and letters ever <clears throat> that he had ever wrote, and he had to inscribe it on the margins of a newspaper and have it smuggled out. This man dedicated literally his life to making up his own rule. And the information, the inspiration that came out of this letter was, was the absolute understanding and dedication to peaceful, nonviolent protesting of what was wrong. And so what I wonder is, what's the difference between them and us? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. There's, we are all one of seven billion people who are all equal to us. There's nothing different. One thing that they had in common is that they realized where their source came from. They realized that their source didn't come from 
their government or their president or their career or their job or their bank account or their wife or husband. Their source didn't come from the outer world. Their source came from within. And what they did is they listened. They listened to this, some of us call it a call, some of us call it intuition, some of us call it that gut feeling. They listened to that voice within them, that voice of God that invited them, that urged them, that pulled them to do what was theirs to do, to make up their own rule. So how many of us here listen to the voice of God within us? Some of us, yeah? Do any of us find ourselves wondering, was that the voice of God or was that me? <laughs> yeah. I want to clarify something. If it doesn't hurt yourself and it doesn't hurt someone else, it's the voice of God, OK? <laughs> yes, listen. Every one of us is born inherently with a wellspring of wisdom. And we can use this. We can begin to listen to it. We can make up our own rules, play our own game. It's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. So the third aspect of an outlaw state of mind is that we live and let live. And so when we really move into and start embracing the outlaw, our inner rebel, our metaphysical rebel, right? We begin to think for ourselves. And when we begin to think for ourselves, we're really living the premise of, of at least this center's philosophy, what, what, what we say is that we teach people how to think, not what to think. We are non-doctrinal, non right? So I, I, as a minister, would never tell you to believe something, tell you to think something. But I would always serve you and support you in learning how to construct your thinking that will serve your soul and, and, and create the life of your dreams. That's what our role is as, as human family, is to remind each other and to be there for each other in breaking down all those false ideas. In the book, How um, God Changes Your Brain, have any of you ever read that? How God Changes Your Brain. <laughs> um, Andy Newberg and Mark Walden, they talk about well, they've done these studies, brain scans, hundreds and hundreds of brain scans on people who are spiritual beings or doing spiritual practices, because what they wanted to see was how does spirituality actually affect your body, right? And so what they found is the number one resource, the number one act to support our mental, spiritual, and physical health is one thing, faith. Faith. And so this is a call to us. What are we having faith in? Because that is going to show up in all those other areas of our life. Are we thinking for ourselves? Are the ideas that are going through our minds ours or someone else's? Is the way that we're acting and leading our lives by our inner call or by someone else's? I will tell you one thing with complete assurity is that when we start to live by our own inner calling, even though it's scary and ridiculously scary sometimes, hence me being up here, um, <laughs> it works. It pays off. You live an extraordinarily joy-filled life. Let me tell you. And when, when we begin to embrace this faith and embrace that every one of us has the ability to heal ourselves, that every one of us is a revealer of truth, then all of the condemnation and judgment and criticism for others, it just melts away. Who here feels really, really good about themselves and still judges other people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See? And so it's, for, it's up to us to get right with ourselves in order to live and let others live. Because they'll figure it out. There is a law that says they will. You know, it's a cause and effect. I want to share with you once again this powerful, powerful Macintosh commercial. Double whammy. Double whammy because this is some good stuff. Stuff here, guys. And I thought, as soon as I heard this again, I thought, this is my tribe. I gotta share this with these people. So here it is one more time. 
Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things a little bit differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. But the one thing you cannot do is ignore them. Because these are the people who change things. The, the, they push the human race forward. And while some may see them as crazy, we, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. My chosen father, Steve, his life may have been more struggle than success. He may have more, had more hard times than, than easy ones. And he may never have felt like his life was truly successful. But what I see now, what I've learned from him, is that the one gift that is more powerful than any that we could give to another person is love, is compassion, is generosity, and is really just being there. Because his fingerprint has been left on my soul forever, and that love will ripple out to the entire universe. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that each and every one of us are crazy enough, are unique enough, are original enough to change the world in our own special way, starting with ourselves. And so what I want to invite us to do this week is to begin to look around, to begin to think and feel and see if what we're doing and who we're being is who we want to be. And if it's not, I invite you to say, internally or externally, I just don't give a damn. <laughs> and when it's necessary, I want you to make up your own rules. And as we do this, we're going to live. We're going to truly live, and we're going to allow others to live. And so thank you all for sharing this time with me. You're so inspiring. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you.